from the dead glory hallelujah christ is risen from the dead glory hallelujah christ is risen from the dead glory hallelujah christ is risen christ is risen glory Jesus Christ is risen, glory, hallelujah. Jesus Christ is risen, glory, hallelujah. Christ is risen, Christ is risen, glory, hallelujah. Christ is risen, Christ is risen. Christ is risen, glory, hallelujah. Jesus Christ is risen, glory, hallelujah. So, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Old Barnes United Church, part of Clifton Pastoral Charge, and a special welcome to those who are joining us tomorrow morning, Monday morning, uh, through the website. A uh, few announcements to begin with. Um, first off, I've been asked to uh, remember our, remembering our mothers and fathers. If you wish to have your mother's name read out and printed in the bulletin on Mother's Day, uh, please get in touch with Leslie by the 5th of May for, for that process. Uh, also, in terms of announcements that are in the bulletin, uh, let's see here. We've got a cheese sale that's on right now. Uh, is that finishes, this finishes this coming Friday, so get your cheese order in by Friday. Uh, also, there is uh, a cleanup going to be happening uh, on the 3rd of May, Monday the 3rd of May at uh, 6 p.m and rain date the next day. Are there any other announcements as such that uh, didn't make it into the bulletin? We, uh, we have uh, at least one person that we'd like to remember, especially in our prayers today and our thoughts. Uh, Jim uh, uh, Kent, uh, Glenda's husband, is pretty low and is in hospital, and so please keep him in our thoughts and prayers as well as Glenda and the rest of the family. Uh, and are there any other folks in that category that you'd like to especially remember today? And that come to mind right away? Uh, there probably are others somewhere. Anyway, um, we debated about whether we should come today a little bit. Uh, the, the, the cases are increasing in our province and starting to come a little bit in our area too. I'm going to ask a question I asked in Hilden this morning. How many of you have already had your first vaccination at least? Uh, that is, uh, Becky, have you? No? So Becky and I and Valerie are both the only three that haven't had it uh, here. Same with Hilden. They pretty well all have had their first vaccination. So that's a, that's a good sign. And we get ours Tuesday. So, um, so any, uh, nothing else. How about birthdays, anniversaries? Birthdays or anniversaries? Uh, Keith Selwyn Smith's birthday is this coming Friday up in the other church. Uh, anybody from here? No? Okay, very good. Happy birthday to Keith. Um, would you stand as you're able and join with me in our statement of reconciliation and remain standing until after the call to worship, please. As we gather in this place, we remember with gratitude that we live and worship on lands that are, by law, the unceded territories of the Mi'kmaq. May we live with respect on this land and in peace and friendship with its people. Now have the lighting of the candles. Thank you. Let us pray.
power of love and goodness at the heart of all creation, help us to connect. Help us to connect to you, to listen to the word that you'll have for us today, and to help us see that connection of unity with all things. We ask this in Christ's name and for the sake of your kingdom. Amen. Come, let us seek the presence of God. We seek to experience the love at the heart of all creation. Come, let us follow Jesus together. We seek the way, the truth, and the life. Come, let us worship and give thanks to God, the Good Shepherd of all. telling folks this morning that uh, my aunt used to have the ladies over to the house when I was a little fellow, maybe six, seven years old, and she got me to memorize that and played the piano while I sang it to the ladies. <laughs> so I know it by heart, long-term memory is still pretty good. So today I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, Indigenous spirituality, a little bit about it, and I'm learning more and more all the time. We were supposed to have uh, an interfaith gathering this afternoon where a guy named Gerald Gloat, uh, who's uh, an indigenous, uh, what's the word, people that work, geologist and historian, uh, was going to give a talk. And uh, it got canceled or postponed today because of the, the COVID numbers. But um, any case, uh, I think I've mentioned this before, but back on the crest back here, the new crest, is in Mohawk. Uh, I can't pronounce it in Mohawk, but it basically translates to the phrase, all my relations. And what I'm told about indigenous spirituality is that all my relations doesn't mean just human relations, but also relationships to the birds, to the animal, to the trees, to the water, to the earth. Uh, that there is an interconnectedness in all things in indigenous spirituality that we all could learn from. That's really helpful. 
And I have one really kind of neat story that uh, Valerie and I uh, experienced a long time ago. Uh, during the Oka crisis, you remember the Oka crisis? Uh, a group of clergy and other lay folks got together with indigenous folks at the Loyalist burial grounds in Fredericton. And we had a big bonfire in the middle and we were kind of walking around in a circle. And as we looked, we looked up into the sky and there were two or three eagles and they were circling in the same direction that we were going at the same time. It still gives me chills when I think about it. But then beyond that, we decided we would take a march from that place down through the, the, the center of Fredericton to the legislature on the other side of town. And as we went, the eagles followed us as we went. It was really quite miraculous. And when we got there, the leader of our group, who was an indigenous person, gave an eagle feather to the MP, who, by the way, his name was Bud Bird. Uh, we gave him an eagle, an eagle feather. And when you have the eagle feather in your hand, you can't be lying. You need to tell the truth. You need to speak from the heart. And this uh, federal MP started giving the federal government line at that time, which wasn't very uh, gracious and the person snatched the eagle feather back out of his hand uh, because it, he wasn't speaking from the heart. And uh, I've always thought of that story in terms of the connection between uh, all my relations, all my relations. And I think in, in a sense I'm going to suggest to you today later in what I'm saying is that all religions at their best kind of get us to that place where we can kind of see the loving source of good at the heart of all creation and how we are all ultimately interconnected despite all of our differences and the different paths and ways that we get there. We are one as we come, as we come joyful to be here in the praise. chapter 10, verses 11 to 18. 
Jesus, the Good Shepherd. I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd, for this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. Spirit of God within us, among us, in all things, we come this day. Open our hearts and minds to your presence and to the word that you would have us hear this day. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. As uh, Trudy was reading, I had a flashback to my Sunday school days. I don't know how many of you remember flannel graphs and little sheep dotting a hillside and Jesus all dressed in a white gown, sort of standing in the middle of it as the good shepherd. Over the years, I've often said uh, I'm not that keen on the idea of the shepherd and, and, the, and the church as the, as the sheep, as the flock, because you might think I'm either trying to pull the wool over your eyes or Felicia, one of the, you know, anyway. But anyway. Think with me for a minute, if you will, about the role of religion in the world. Is it a force for good or is it a force for evil? A source for love and reconciliation or a force of competition and division? If we're honest, I think we would have to say presently and potentially it can be either one. It can be either a source of love and wonder, or it can be a source for evil. Especially if you grew up the way I did and have religion as being all about the afterlife and who gets in, and you had two lists, those who made it and those who didn't. And our group happens to have made it, and the rest of you are going to hell. You know, that was sort of the way I grew up. Maybe not quite as strong as that, but that was the implication. So much of the reason why God's kingdom doesn't come on earth in all of its fullness as it is in heaven, the way we pray in the Lord's Prayer, I would suggest to you is because of the abuse of power and the en enlisting of God in either empowerment or abuse of power or oppression. And the Bible, of course, reflects both of those viewpoints. And so I'm so glad that we are part of a tradition that is selective. And indeed, all religions are selective about the scriptures they use and that interpret it through the lens of a tradition. And our tradition says that religion needs to be a force of good and inclusion and justice. And if you look at the Bible, uh, you get versions of both of these perspectives, not only in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament. There's some wonderful passages in the Old Testament, and of course, to know the New Testament, you really need to know the Old Testament, it just enriches it so much more. But both are there, in both the Old and the New Testament. And including in the Gospel reading that we read today, John's Gospel. John's Gospel is named after the disciple John, whom we told was the one that Jesus loved, something special about him. And love is indeed a hallmark of all the documents in the New Testament that are attributed to the Johns and the Johannine church and tradition. And you know what they are? They're uh, the Gospel of John, first, second, and third letter of John, right near the end of the New Testament, and then of course the book of Revelation, which was supposedly written by the bishop of Patmos named John. And all of these talk about love. 
Uh, I still remember as a teenager trying to impress a, a Christian girlfriend and going through the Bible looking for passages about love and uh, skipping right over 1 Corinthians 13 because uh, it didn't translate it as love in the King James Version, it was charity, if you have not charity. So I had to go all the way to 1 John 4, which is actually one of the readings for today that I should have read. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love is from God, and God is love, and those who live and love are in God, and God is in them, and so on. Uh, so it was a great, great passage. So John is indeed about love, but John is also uh, quite uh, divisive in a lot of the things that is written in the Gospel of John. You know, I, I kind of I'm not a big fan of the Gospel of John other than selective parts of it because the picture that it has of Jesus is so very, very different from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you have a person, a human being who is divine. Uh, in the Gospel of John, you have God in drag. You have God masquerading as a human. You know, it's a very different kind of slant on who Jesus is. God in human disguise, according to the John. And therefore, in the passage that we read today, uh, it could have Jesus saying, uh, you, know, I don't, you know, nobody takes my life from me in the crucifixion. I lay it down and I'll pick it up again. I'm in complete control. And that's what happens in the garden, you know. Uh, they all fall to the feet of Jesus when they, they confront him in the garden because this God, this Jesus, is actually God and in control according to John's version of things, you know. Now, uh, there are many places where the divinity of Christ is kind of crystallized in the New Testament. For Paul, uh, it seems to be the crucifixion and resurrection. For the writer of the Gospel of Mark, the baptism is all important when, when he receives the Spirit. For Matthew and Luke, it's the virgin birth. And for the Gospel of John, though, John has, in the beginning, was the Word, and the Word was with God and was God, and the Word was made flesh. Jesus and the Christ was there right from the beginning of creation with the God. That's the perspective of the writer of the Gospel of John, you know. But uh, I think there might have been a good reason for the writer of John wanting to have such a, what is called a high Christology uh, for Jesus. And it, part of it has to do with the competition that was happening. Because by the end of the first century, when the Gospel of John was written, somewhere between 90 and 100 uh, AD or CE, uh, Pharisees, who the Gospel of John calls the Jews, uh, and the Christian Jews were at each other's throats. They were, it, there was a huge family fight going on. You know, and both of them were saying, we're the true inheritors of Moses now that the temple and Jerusalem are gone and we're the only two left. It's, and the Christians were saying, no, it's us. And uh, the Pharisees were saying, no, it's us. We have, our, we have the law, we have the scriptures. And the Christians would say, well, we've got God. <laughs> we've, got, we've got God incarnate. We've got Jesus. You know, he was more than the Messiah. He was God incarnate, you know. And uh, there was this division that was going on at the time. And of course, uh, Adolf Hitler loved the Gospel of John because it didn't just refer to the Pharisees in the fight, but called them the Jews, right? And so, uh, how many of you have brothers and sisters, you know? And when you have brothers and sisters, do you ever have a fight with them? You know, and, uh, and you might call them names and everything else, but hey, allow somebody from outside of the family to call them those names and you'd be their first defenders, right? Because they're family, right? And that, that's kind of what was happening in the Gospel of John. They were at each other. And, uh, but then later, when the church became more and more less Jewish and more Gentile, those very same words in a different context were used as hatred of the Jews and for, for uh, anti-Semitism. But one of the passages that I grew up with, which is also from the Gospel of John, which was used over the centuries as a way of saying, our religion is the only religion, the religion that's best, and all the rest of you are going to hell, was the passage that I'm gonna to quote to you now, see if you remember it. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except by me. Right? Yeah. 
What a, what a passage that's been used as a source of division over the centuries. Sounds a lot like, I am the good shepherd. I'm not the hired hand like those Pharisees are or the scribes. I'm the good shepherd and I'll bring my sheep together, but they are going to scatter you and divide you, right? And so there is that there in the Gospel of John. And yet in the midst of this passage that we read today, there is a saying that Jesus has right in the midst of it. He says, you know, I have other sheep that belong to other folds. You know, I have other sheep. There, there are other folds out there that you don't know about, but they're mine too because they hear my voice and they know my voice and they do God's will, right? It, it reminded me uh, of our Bible study a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about family and how family is more than race and blood, but uh, Jesus says, you know, family needs to be uh, the circle needs to be wide. It needs to be anybody who does God's will and, and is part of my family, right? Another way of thinking about that particular passage, you know. So how generous and non-competitive can we be as church and as Christians? Is there a way to promote our way proudly and yet not think that we are the only game in town? You know, sometimes I think that if I was born in India, I'd be a Hindu. You know, I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't be a Christian because just accident of birth of where I was brought up. So I spent a lot of years thinking about that phrase, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And today I want to give you a bunch of different ways of thinking about that that will keep its importance for us and yet be not a source of division and harm. First off, uh, you need to know that there are a group of biblical scholars, Jesus scholars in particular, who spent a good part of their lifetime in what was called the quest for the historical Jesus, trying to figure out which words and actions actually were from Jesus and which ones uh, were attributed to him. You know? And most of the stuff in the Gospel of John that's not a parable or a story, they would have said, you know, there was 40 years of oral transmission. The little short sayings and parables and stories of Jesus probably go back to him, but uh, these long uh, sermons that Jesus has in the Gospel of John, that was probably more John than it was Jesus. And so they would say, nobody comes to the Father but by me. That's probably more John than Jesus. That's one possibility, one way of looking at this. Secondly, if we say, okay, no, I don't, I don't like that one. Jesus really did say this. Uh, but, you know, when Jesus was saying these things, he wasn't talking about Hindus or Muslims or Buddhists or anybody else. He was talking about other Jewish groups that were in his circle, you know, like the Pharisees and the Zealots, you know. Nobody comes to the Father and brings in the kingdom of God like, except me, this way of peaceful forgiveness and nonviolence, not, not the way of the zealots with their violence, uh, not, not the way of the, the Pharisees and the scribes with their, so ex, their exclusion. Oh, hi there, uh, little ladybug here. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, uh, all my relations, all my relations. You know. <laughs> uh, I can remember, um, you, you know, uh, Islam as a religion didn't start till about seven centuries after Christianity was founded. So it wasn't even in the, in the ball game at the time, right? I remember asking Reverend, uh, or Reverend, Rabbi Barry Levy, a Jewish rabbi at McGill, the head of the, the religious studies department there, how, how would you think, what do you think about that phrase, nobody comes to the Father but by me? Uh, he said, well, you know, we Jews, we're already at the Father. <laughs> we don't need to come. We're already there. <laughs> Which was kind of a smart answer. But probably for me, the best, the two best responses that I liked were ones by my favorite, one of my favorite guys, Marcus Borg, who you who have heard me talk about. And he suggests, nobody comes to the Father except by me is not so much an expression of fact as it is an expression of love. 
It's kind of like saying, my partner is the most beautiful person in the world and God chose them for me and there's no other. Now, factually, I mean, other than in my case, factually, that may not be necessarily true, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it's, it's how you feel. And so nobody comes to the Father but by me. That's, that's how the John's church felt about Jesus. You know, nobody comes to the Father but by him. All these other choices out there, they pale in comparison, you know. That would be one way. But one of the ways uh, that I really liked was the second one. And uh, he said, maybe, maybe that we should focus on the way. The way of Jesus is the only way, truth and the life. And that's the only way you can come to God is through love and self-sacrifice if need be and, and forgiveness and uh, seeking justice and peace. That is the only way. But the way of Jesus that we know through Jesus is also in the best of other religions. In Buddhism, for example. You know, that might be another way of approaching and keeping respecting those words in John's Gospel. And then finally, uh, it came to me as I was writing this, maybe the high Christology in John is actually helpful. In the Gospel of John, Jesus refers, or John, uh, Jesus refers to himself several times with the phrase, I am. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, I am the door, I am the bread of life, I am the living water, I am, I am, I am, I am. And if you remember, when Moses came to the burning bush and was given the commission to go back to Egypt, he said, who shall I say sent me? What's your name, God? And God says, I am, I am who I am. And so that, that connection would not be lost on the, on the readers and, and hearers of this John's Gospel. Whenever Jesus would say, I am, it would be one more affirmation that he really was God in the flesh, the incarnation, right? And so the I am God has other folds of sheep. And God wishes that all of us, maybe, in the world will be one. It's just another way to try to get your head around, around this, you know. Many years ago, the United Church of Canada came out with a document called Mending the World. And I, I spoke about this at the interfaith gathering. Mending the World basically said, the word ecumenical is kind of too narrow these days. We shouldn't be trying to make common cause with just other Christians, other churches, other than our own, but maybe with other faiths other people with no faith, but who are seeking to mend the world, who are trying to make the world a better place, to bring about reconciliation of all things, you know? Because that's, that's the task that we're called to be about, is reconciliation in the world. And uh, so my suggestion to you is that whatever path, whatever spiritual discipline you have, that you seek that deeper relationship with God, the one that goes beyond just uh, asking God for, to get you out of a jam that you happen to be in, but one that kind of communes with God, that kind of listens to God instead of his talking, you talking all the time. The one that kind of helps you see the world from God's perspective, which is the interconnectedness of all things. And if we can do that, then I think where I began today, we can be a religion that actually makes a positive difference in the world rather than being part of the problem. Amen. Let's seek other folds.
is helping hand to families in need. Florence Gava is a grandmother. She lives in a small community in Zimbabwe where she looks after her grandchildren. Recently, a series of challenging events has pushed her whole family to the edge. First, nine of Florence's 12 cattle died of disease. That meant that less of Florence's fields could be turned for food. Shortly after her livestock died, there was a severe drought. If disease and drought weren't devastating enough, COVID-19 struck. Florence's family didn't have enough food to survive. Thankfully, Florence's story doesn't end there. When the situation was most dire, your gifts through mission and service helped Florence's life change. With the support of generous people like you, Florence's family received a monthly food ration of life-saving beans, meal, and cooking oil through June and July when they were most in need. Other families just like hers, 7,000 of them, received the same life-saving support. Every gift matters. In Canada right now, COVID-19 is the final straw for families who were already pushed to the financial edge before the virus struck. By the end of the year, 12,000 people per day living around the world could die of hunger because of the pandemic, and the situation is getting worse by the hour. Compassion, care, and love are up to us, Together we can create a better world, a world where grandmothers like Florence don't have to watch their family go hungry. Your generosity through mission and service helps create a world where everyone belongs and where we take care of each other so no one is hungry or alone. Your gifts truly do make a difference. Thank you for giving generously. Thank you indeed. I uh, I would draw your attention to the bottom of the main bulletin on the bottom of the second page. There's a little poem there that uh, I discovered many years ago. Actually, I mentioned it to one of the people who were part of the group that wrote that Draw the Circle Wide, and they included it in a lot of their literature. By Edwin Markham, he drew a circle that ruled me out, heretic rebel, a thing to flout, but love and I had the wit to win. We do a circle that took him in. Wonderful little poem from my perspective. And indeed, the work of the Mission and Service Fund, and indeed all of our call, is to be about that kind of thing, of drawing the circle wide and wider still. And so we thank the United Church of Canada and you folks in this church for making a difference in this community and the larger the world through your gifts of time and talent and treasure. Let us pray. God, we pray that you take our gifts of time, talent, and treasure and use them for the work of this church and for your kingdom. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. So would you please stand as you're able and join me in our affirmation of faith, a new creed. We are not alone. 
We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, who made flesh, reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. So we're going through a, a tough period right now as uh, in this area in a way that we haven't been, we've been lucky up until now and we're still pretty lucky. However, uh, our thoughts and prayers uh, with, with uh, Jim and Glenda and with all those going through non-COVID related things as well as uh, all of you dealing with the increased anxiety that comes with this pandemic that we're in with. So would you pray with me now? Loving Creator God, you who we know especially through Jesus of Nazareth, we come this morning to worship and to give you thanks for all your gifts to us of life and love. We find ourselves increasingly anxious and frightened about the future for ourselves and others. More serious variants of the virus seem to be here and increasing among us. Thank you for being with us on this difficult leg of the journey and for working to stop the pain and the suffering. We pray for other provinces near to us that have it even worse than we do and for far away like countries like India who are especially having a hard time. We pray for all of our relations in creation human and non-human, suffering under climate change and the actions of humans that contribute to it. And we remember that especially in this Earth, week, Earth Day week. Give us the wisdom to make the radical changes we need to make to help us increasingly see and respect our interconnections with all things. We to continue to pray for justice in law and thank goodness for the verdict this week in the racist trial in the States. And we pray for an end to all racist and sexist systems and to root out and name things that we're not even aware of. We pray for an end to violence and we pray that our actions and words can be good news for the poor and those who are hurting the most. We pray for the sick, for their restoration to health and wholeness, and for their caregivers suffering under the stress of dealing with folks with Alzheimer's and other things. We pray for those dying, that the presence and power of your spirit will be experienced by those folks. We pray for all those who are suffering economically, loss of jobs, loss of businesses, and from the up and down seesaw of shutdowns that are happening. We pray for good and timely and wise decisions by our healthcare officials like Dr. Strang and politicians to keep pandemic from spreading like wildfire. And we pray that people smarten up and pay attention and stay the blazes home. We pray for our churches as they make decisions about the present and the future. We pray for our effectiveness as part of your mission that we are called to. And we come now with our individual and silent prayers of thanksgiving and intercession, we ask you to hear them now, O God, in silence. We 
We ask all these things in the name of Jesus, who taught us all to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So uh, it occurred to me when we're singing this next piece, I'd never heard it before, and uh, the name of the hymn is Are You a Shepherd? And it talks about what a good shepherd is like. And it occurred to me that so many people in the world have religions where the God is not a good shepherd. And, and that's not just in other religions, that's within Christianity as well. And so part of our call is to promote a God that's unconditionally loving and caring for all creation. Are you a shepherd? Shepherd, good shepherd, who leads us safely through dangers, walk all me our fears. Are you a father who shelters and feeds us, shares in our laughter and wipes away tears? Yes, you are shepherd. and helps us to rest. Are you a teacher who daily prepares us, challenging students to offer their best? Yes, you are shepherd, parent, and teacher, but you are greater than all that we know. You guide us. We want to love you and bring you delight. Yes, you are shepherd, parent, and teacher, but you are greater than all that we know. from this place to share the experience and the love of God you have experienced yourselves with others. Draw your circles wider and wider still. And as you do that, may the grace of Christ attend you. The love of God surround you and the Holy Spirit keep you today and always. Amen. You shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace.
Hey. Mm-hmm.